he took off then after 38 minutes after take off he was off the radar and he was flying a plane which is going triple seven one of the finest planes ever in the history so it just he just went off after 38 minutes We have breaking news. Malaysia Airlines confirms it has lost contact with a plane carrying 227 passengers. It seems to have vanished into thin air. What do we tell the family members? What do we tell the media? Most of us do not know. I don't know whether it is still in open media or not because when we uh, spoke to the people there, when he was talking to the ATC, his last uh, line was, Good night, Malaysia 370. Hi friends. Welcome to the Aspire and Acquire podcast. I'm your host Sandeep Suri. Join me for listening to some incredible stories about some of the best professionals from very diverse fields like combat flying, robotic surgery, dancing, tea farming, journalism, deep sea diving and so on. These accomplished professionals are not just outstanding in their jobs but also have unique stories to share with us. We have tried to make the show truly global by having these guests from different parts of the world. So without further ado, let's dive into the session. The race to conquer 70% of the earth is not a new phenomenon. The Roman emperor Caligula was the first to declare war on the sea. and since then there has been a trend towards dominating the seas at one point in time great britain ruled over more than half of the world and had the most powerful navy but president roosevelt once said a good navy is not a provocation to war it is the surest guarantee of peace well friends we have the opportunity to interact with commander mandeep from indian navy in today's episode of aspire and acquire commander mandeep started his career in the aeronautical engineering wing of the Indian Navy after getting commissioned into the Indian Navy he joined the prestigious squadron IL-38 in Goa in a very unfortunate event during an exercise session the two IL-38 aircrafts collided midair and commander mandeep was given the arduous task of leading and sending the IL-38 to Russia for repairs it took 2 years of hard work to get the aircraft back on track and ferrying it to Russia via Iran and Ukraine was an extremely challenging task. Commander Mandeep was selected for a midlife upgrade program for the fleet and was sent to St. Petersburg for this job. Then an opportunity came his way when he was inducted into the team of 737 Boeing planes as the maritime reconnaissance for India, commonly called as the MR. He was sent to Seattle for this training. He was also part of the search and rescue mission to investigate the mysterious disappearance of Malaysia Airlines flight 370 and was deputed to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia for this challenging task. Subsequent to that, Commander Mandeep started handling the Boeing fleet from the technical headquarters. He also got an exciting opportunity to manage the drone fleet for the Indian Navy. This was also another major exposure for him. of what future aviation would look like commander mandeep was awarded a corona fighter badge from western naval command for selfless service during covid-19 he recently took voluntary retirement from the indian navy and is now working for an inventory management company so let's quickly dive into the show Welcome to Aspire and Acquire Commander Mandeep. Pleasure to have you with us. Thank you Mr. Sandeep. Uh, it's an honor to be part of your show. Well, thanks for being with us. Uh, let's dive into the show. Can you share with us how you started your journey with the Indian Navy? So, Indian Navy was never my plan actually. It was something like I was a very studious boy studying medicals. My brother was in army but I thought, you know, let me change and I want to be going to medicals. What happens is, uh, when I came by medicals, DPMT in Delhi, I could not get through the first list, but 
I could get to the Navy after SSB in Bhopal. But what happened in seventh day, honestly, when I got through in Navy, and that at the time I got through medical second list. So there was a big uh, kind of chaos in the family. My father wanted, okay, when they go for medicals, my brother says, no, I know he would do good in the Navy. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I'm in the Army, he's in the Navy, you know, the sister might go there for sweeping so like chaos, like this, to go on three carders and on the one loop. That was it. So finally, my brother's word prevailed and I joined. Sorry. That's interesting. Can you just walk us through a typical day in the life of a um, uh, naval officer? Typical day is very different. Like, you know, we do not have, um, I can't say that, uh, you know, basically, life, like, life has many facets. Naval life has also got many facets. Like, you know, there is a duration when you have a typical day during the training time. Typical day, life in the ship at sea. It was a typical day of life in the ship in harbor. And there is a typical day of life and deputation. So we have got, you know, variety. But let me talk to you when there's a life in a ship, in a harbor, for example. Mm-hmm. So what happens is, you know, generally, we uh, morning we go for a nice fitness routine just to get our BMR going. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I join office uh, over there's something called as uh, morning stand-up where we all get together, discuss the plan for the day, discuss the forthcoming uh, dictation or forthcoming uh, mission or something like that and see what all are the problems, what is the scope of the work. And then we get into the complete rut of uh, work. And, you know, once your department planning is done, now you do planning with your commanding officer. Okay, so this is the way I have planned for today. I don't even know what is coming up next day, next month, next next month. So it is like a planning. All the time we are planning. And by end of the day, we take again a stand-up and see what all has been done. Well, then you go home, spend time with your family. But in case there are times when uh, you know, the dockyard is working onto your ship, and sometimes you have to stay overnight, depends upon you know, the kind of mission coming up, how close is the mission, how serious is that effect. So that's the way, you know. So that's the way we go about it. There's a typical day of uh, life in a ship and up. And I'm just curious, you know, it must be very different, you know, during peacetime and, and wartime, of course. You know, wartime, you are extremely, extremely busy and, and, and doing uh, a lot of things, you know, that, that are expected to be to be done for the country. But during peacetime, you know, typically, you know, the days are as busy as, um, you know, like, like a war day? Of course not. But what are the real difference between the two? See, um, there is a very famous saying of... Uh, the U.S. general, I think, if I'm not wrong, is Norman Schwarzkopf. Mm-hmm. And Norman Schwarzkopf, he said, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have to go by that logic. You get you know, more like, you know, if you have to be less stressful, you know, you have to be, and you want your systems to be put in the perfect state of uh, operational readiness, you have to sweat in peace. And that peace time is this. So yeah. both are different facets again. So we do not take rest. It is like even at harbor also you are sweating. When the ship is on repairs, sometimes the AC is not working. The temperature inside is 45 degrees inside the ship. And you are still working. So it is something like that. So I would say that, you know, more you sweat in peace, less you bleed in Yeah, I'll say Okay, moving on. Uh, we all know Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 mysteriously went missing over the Gulf of Thailand uh, in the South China Sea. You are part of the mission search and rescue operations. Can you share your experience of the Syria rescue mission? Sure. So, you know, this MH370, I would say it is still the mystery for the, you know, I would say one well, of the biggest mystery for the naval aviation as such. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, you know, so this plane was you know, only 239 passengers and it was uh, 
commanded by Captain Ahmed Shah. He took off and after 38 minutes after takeoff, he was off the radar. And he was flying a plane which is Boeing 777, one of the finest planes ever in the history. So, it just he just went off after 38 minutes. And uh, most of us do not know, I don't know whether it's still in open media or not, because when we uh, spoke to the people there, when he was talking to the ATC, his last uh, line was, Good night. Malaysia 370. So, anyways, this just uh, so what happened the moment this accident happened, uh, the MEA, Ministry of External Affairs, uh, gave us a nod 11 o'clock in the night telling that, you know, uh, one aircraft needs to be launched for search and rescue. And, uh, and it has to be launched in the morning, 7 o'clock. And you have only the night to prepare. That is quite a challenge. Because you do not know the length of the mission. You do not uh, know who's the crew, what would be the kind of uh, flying loading, how many flying hours will be flying. So there are many question marks. But commanding officer called me and he told uh, commander Mundi, let's prepare. So I was a technical team leader. And uh, I started preparing because we have to prepare a lot of things like you know, oils and lubricants and so many things. Sure. In my own technical team. We prepared and uh, apparently we got a green signal. Just imagine we did not have a single valid passport. We normally travel on a white passport. So we did not have all passports were expired. But you know, when it comes to missions, so, you know, all the countries, you know, such, especially SAR missions, SAR, such and rescue missions, all countries are very forthcoming. So we carried a passport. The moment we land, there was an MEF rep waiting for us at the airport. Immediately went out. He extended the validity of the passport, put the visa, and we were told, okay, prepare the aircraft for the SAR mission. And there were, you know, such a surprising thing to see was there were 26 countries participating in that mission. 26 Most countries? Wow. Yes. There were more than 50 ships at sea and there were, I could see on the tarmac, there are at least 30 different planes from different countries. It was a very, uh, you know, kind of, uh, for me, it was very exciting because I've never seen uh, so many countries operating from a single tarmac. Yeah, I'm sure it must be one of the biggest uh, rescue missions in the world. Yes. We started searching and in fact, uh, we were the, there was uh, one day there was weather also was bad, but, uh, but our commanding officer told it is within my limit and we will go for the mission. That day only few countries, uh, including us, we went. But sadly, we could not find anything and in fact, ships could not find anything for at least so many days. So we were part of the team wherein uh, you know, we decided, considering the fuel, the Marsat signal, the ADS Bravo signal, you know, considering that the fuel it was carrying, it couldn't have gone anywhere and therefore the plane was lost at sea. Now, whether it was a deliberate mission or it was, well, they're all theories, but for a um, technical and a guy, it is aircraft lost at sea because it couldn't have returned from the point where it had left. So that is the whole story. And the whole mission part continued part for how long? The year continued for quite long. I would say, you know, million of dollars have been spent by you know, all the countries. And I would say, you know, at least 60 million dollars have been spent only by Australia and Malaysia combined. Quite a big uh, thing. It's a quite a big uh, mystery in the history of aviation. Yeah, that's quite a sad story too. It was overwhelming to see, you know, when it comes to SAR mission, you know, how countries in the world get together as one and start searching those, you know, that single plane carrying through 30 miles. That was very heartwarming. Yeah. How does the Navy maintain readiness and preparedness for various situations and missions? 
See, this is a question which is uh, quite a question I may not be able to answer in detail, but I must tell you in single line which I wanted to tell you that, you know, more is fed in peace, less you bleed in war. We have a kind of a plan. The annual plan is there. There are exercises, there are annual exercises, which is already planned. And the big year has got a different plan. So if we are doing exercise in a very professional way, naturally when it comes to a conflict, you will be ready for it. So yeah. beyond this, I may not be able to get into the intricacies how the preparedness is done. But I would only state that it's all depends upon how professionally and how seriously you do those exercises. No, I completely respect that privacy, you know, uh, whatever whatever you said or whatever you can say, um, you know, that's fine. And we will uh, com completely understand that. Yeah. Can you talk about the role of technology uh, in the Navy and how it has evolved over uh, a period of time? Navy and aviation, that it's a very rapid a very rapid pace and I'm sure you can as a, a non-aviator guy also you can know you can feel yeah so there is a technology in the Navy and there is a technology of a warfare okay so let me tell about the warfare in single line see earlier used to be an attack and defense you know how the world war used to happen you know pre-world war era it was you know attack and defense during the cold war time the Strategy started changing from attack and defense towards intelligence and prevention. The warfare started shifting towards that. And when the warfare started shifting towards intelligence and pre uh, prevention, the even the need of technology was proportionately shifting towards it. So it slowly started moving towards uh, you know AI, machine learning, and all those aspects. Especially, I would say, countries like... Uh, you know, Israel, US, French, you know, and now India also has started uh, quite a bit of, uh, you know, you know, started uh, the technology spree. They are in Doha. As far as role of technology in the Navy is concerned, it is evolving and it is evolving very fast. So we have a generally, uh, we say that five to seven years policy. Every five to seven years, you have to change the technology. Because that technology is redundant by seventh year. That is the way we are going about, you know, how the flow of technology is moving like this. And it's ever evolving, right? I mean, it keeps changing. It's ever evolving. And, you know, Navy's motto has been, you know, to embrace the new technology. It's not that, you know, we will continue to use the same systems which we were using. I think, talking about Indian defense system, I think we're spending quite a bit right now. And I'm sure the common people also can see the kind of Acquisitions we are doing from the open market, the Rafales and the F-16, the, all those fighters and the submarines. So, so many things are happening right now. So we are quite ready to embrace the new technology while we are making our own also. And things do change at a very rapid pace, right? So, uh, you know, it's always a catch-up game for countries. Uh, because it is changing at such a phenomenal pace. You know, our listeners would be very keen to understand how does the Navy approach leadership and team building within its ranks? Leadership and team building, it's a very vast, you know, <laughs> topic. But let's talk about, you know, team building. Because I've also been a part of many team building exercises in the Navy. See, one thing Navy's approach, I feel, is... Uh, See, the the training of a batch is together. Okay. The Navy trains people together, the batches together, so that there is a good camaraderie between the people. The, the, whether it is sailors, officers, javans. So training together itself is a first block towards team building. The second fundamental is no discrimination. So when there is no discrimination, uh, people get equal opportunities for, you know, there's no discrimination of any kind. In fact, there are women officers, women sailors also going to be joining very soon. So if there is no discrimination, you know, that's the environment of 
uh, growth and prosperity. That's an environment where people want to freely, uh, you know, build uh, relations with each other, you know, and you know, they're free to talk to each other and establish a shared vision. So the moment you start talking to each other, you know you're working for a common cause, you establish a shared vision. So that's my um, third point for the team building. Okay, and the fourth point is we are made to understand this team is always better than a single individual. So whenever you know you, you you know I'll quote a very simple example. Even if we go for a repair of equipment in a ship, we I will not send as a leader. I will not send a single person. Go see there is a problem in that equipment. I will send two to three people. Okay, go see there is a problem. Firstly, that single person doesn't become indispensable. So secondly, if he gets a shock or something, the second person will uh, you know, uh, help him in giving the first aid. Thirdly, you know, whenever you are working with experienced individual, you tend to build your own set of skills. And you are working as a team, you build that skill for you know, uh, team building. So that's the way we go about so these are the four points I would say it's the Navy's way, natural way of uh, towards uh, team building. Yeah, and it's a process of uh, learning as well, right? Yes. You know, when you're sending somebody, uh, you know, when you're tagging someone with another teammate, obviously he's he's trying to learn along with him, with his colleague. Yes. And I must tell you one more thing, like when you're working in a ship or an aviation environment where flight safety or ship safety is a prime most thing. We do not uh, become an authoritative leader. You know, there is a fundamental call as servant leadership. You heard about that? Yes, I have. So basically, it's a leader who is ready to understand the requirements of the team. If there is a problem, allowing the team to sort out the problem amongst themselves unless it requires escalation. So in the ship, you know, we have to work like that. Because I cannot put a stress on someone, go oh, carry on, I want this thing to be done within one hour. You know, it is not the way we manage. We say that, okay, we have to do it in one hour. You, What team you want? You want me to come and help you. You want my assistant. The person will say, sir, I need this, this, this. I will go and resolve. So it comes from the inner self. Okay. Sure. So the emphasis is on moral courage, ethical behavior, and loyalty. I would say, as far as leadership goes. Yeah, those are three key ingredients, I would say, for any leadership. How does the Navy prioritize safety and well-being for its personnel during deployments and operations? At the time, I was... I did not do a mission. I did not know that there is uh, how much effort Navy takes for the well-being of the person and their families also. Sure. So, in fact, uh, you know, uh, I was in ship in 1999, which was being deployed for the uh, you know, patrolling of uh, waters towards uh, the western region during the Kabul conflict. That's the time I saw, you know, See, safety is the inbuilt culture. You know, let me address both the issues. Safety is the inbuilt thing. We are trained to be safe. So there are, there are protocols how we follow. If there is an evolution, there is an event, whether there is a firing, there is, a, you know, there is some, you know, boat mission is there. You have to lower the boats. So safety has been ingrained into us. And the practice of all those events have made us learn what is the, you know, definition of safety and we we are in that domain of safety margins always so that is goes about safety about well-being you know it's uh i was telling you during this Kabul war or any other mission mm -hmm. uh, i did not know i got um, married that's the time i know so i came to know that there is a nice well-being cell which is formed when you go at sea so a cell of comprising of an officer and two, three jawans is formed to assist the families who are left behind, to assist the families uh, to get in touch with their uh, husbands or 
like you know if they have any problem to get across a message to them they are the intermediary okay family is very well taken care of you are you know there is a complete uh, there is a vehicle on a call there is a driver on a call somebody is not well is taken to a hospital the commanding officer's wife almost every day basis gets a report that you know this is happening you know this was a problem which came and this is the way we sorted it out so this us this is a separate facet of navy i had not seen till now oh it's, this is very interesting it's called well being salus it right yes. it, and it is not defined anywhere uh, so need it is nowhere it is written that you are supposed to be like this mm. so this is i would say that uh, you know unknown domain or a unset uh, thing which they do from themselves it is not anywhere in the navy order it is written you are supposed to form a uh, you know said it which is supposed to help your families now is very and, and is that common in army and and uh, air forces yeah. well yes okay this problem but came to know later you being cross deployments i came to know that uh, even for some thing some similar uh, setup is made for the families to take care because you know if you are not at peace you cannot perform if you all the time thinking okay my wife is running out of uh, gas cylinder or you know my child is not where would be taking her and she's running in fever so that's it so yeah but very it's a nice setup i would say yeah very thoughtful very thoughtful from the navy yeah we would like to understand uh, the unwritten rules of the indian navy that you can share with us uh, and our listeners and on the rules so so what i mean is basically an implicit set of rules not explicit explicit is known to the world or at least to everybody because there is a sop written there but what is not written but usually followed in the organization is what i meant see evolve um, it's a very uh, controversial question but let me answer this in my own way i'd love to answer this because sometimes you know uh, you can understand like suppose there is a organization you have your core work but sometimes from the core work you also get lot of work which is not related to your core work you know somebody is coming you have to be a liaison officer or somebody is uh, has to go there you have to assist that person so one thing is we started doing is we don't volunteer you understand right 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 so that's the unsaid you know yeah. we don't volunteer because you know if you volunteer see if there is a somebody says no you know you have to go there it's a very nice thing you know they like to go for snow skiing for example right yes so i would say i would not volunteer because you know when you volunteer you know, when you do a snow skiing you have to come and write a report the report is as per it's said to the dude whenever you go out you come back from some given duty or temporary duty or write up i might as well don't go for a two day three days snow skiing i would rather go for a one month of snow skiing and then write a single bit. that is fine so you know we try to avoid volunteer one more uh, unset i would say rule is uh, you know nobody mentions this you know i feel um, making good connections making good friends is very important it's a totally unset rule but people are doing it because uh, it's a rule uh, which will help you taking your life forward it's a very important thing yeah see the set rule is we have a organization structure where we work we work yes for the hierarchy okay but hierarchy does not state that you have to make a personal relation at personal level but it is very important sometimes to have well, good interpersonal relations yeah what we in the corporate world call it you know networking skills right so it's very important to network so i think it's the same thing it it never used to be there mr uh, it's just recently you know the life is getting very complex technology is evolving you know the you know the warfare type is changing everything is changing so here you need the stresses are increasing so interpersonal relationship really helps sometimes so there is no rule see with my boss i do not have to make relationships or uh, in the person skill he's my boss he will command i will follow but somewhere in the evening you know i would say sir why don't we sit for a drink sir why don't we this thing mm-hmm. the over the drink i can share my problems he can understand oh my god 
Commander Maldeep is operating under this constraint. No, I must take care of him. Okay, so right. this is the thing I'm saying. I think that's a very informal way of communicating with your with your yeah, right? was, which is never read before. You know, we used to or uh, this we used to hesitate talking to our seniors, our commanding officers, this thing. Because the leadership style was quite different, but leadership style over a period has is evolving. Right, yes. right. So therefore, you know, this is a different scenario. So I would yeah. say I would like to in the sense that uh, the answer drew. Yeah. Sure. Well said. Yeah. So you served for about uh, twenty plus years uh, in the Indian Navy. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So 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 after so many years of uh, serving the nation and leaving the uniform, your heart must be heavy and full of emotions on the last day when you were leaving the Indian Navy after serving so long. Talk to us about that day and the feelings that you've had uh, that particular moment. Yeah. The last day was actually, you know, my eyes were red last day. So last day when I was wearing my uniform, you know, my daughter was just uh, 10 and 13 years. They told father, you want to click a picture with you because this is our last day in uniform. That itself, you know, yeah, the I... was thing and I was... Uh, I don't know how to go to no office. So anyways, I, oh, I went to the office and uh, there was, you know, everybody uh, greeted me and uh, there was a nice uh, kind of a tea, high tea arranged for me when I had to speak. Uh, it was very difficult. Yeah. See, yeah. Uh, there are different circumstances I had to meet. Uh, maybe we can talk to you later, but let me simply this question. So, Leaving uniform is a very difficult thing, you know. So I, there was a time, as I mentioned, the beginning of this uh, talk, I was not ready to wear. It. I wanted to go to medicals in Malala Azad Medical College, and here I am on this day. I do not want to leave the uniform, but there were some circumstances in which I had to leave, which I am not too late about that. So, anyways, all those happened. And then my very close, see, what I am, again, I'm coming back to all making corrections thing. So, uh, you know, the executive officer of the naval base, he had called me uh, to his office for, you know, just for a parting kind of uh, cup of tea. So after at 10 o'clock, I went there and, you know, it was so heartwarming to see he was there to receive me at the gate of his base with his all guards and everything. Everywhere, everyone saluting me there. Wow. Okay. So, greeted me at the gate, clicked some pictures with me, the main gate, and he took me straight to uh, one squadron, like uh, it's called a PA pass squadron. It's the squadron uh, which I have worked for three years. I was same squadron which I went for the, like, you know, SAR mission. The commanding officer was also waiting for me in the base of the building to receive me. And he received me and, uh, you know, took me to the airplane, which, you know, for which uh, we had done acceptance from the uh, USA in 2014. There the aircraft was started up and he took me for a you know, one hour ride on the plane. We flew, we did a sortie for one hour. And we came back, the moment I came back, landed, uh, you know, the full squadron was there cheering for me. And, you know, it was a very, like this day, I cannot forget. It still you know, flashes in front of me. And then they, uh, you know, all gave me a momento for this day. And that was it, you know. And then I went and, uh, yeah. So the how the day ended was also very interesting. You know, my wife had come down to office. Okay, my boss had invited me. Invite, you know, that was a surprise for you, by the way? Yes, yes, that was Good. a surprise. Yes. Yeah. So I told, then my boss tells me in the complete gathering, now I'm handing you, handing him over to you now. <laughs> he, well said. I'm, the, I'm his commanding officer, now you are his commanding officer. Then he told, tells me, Commander Bandeep, you are out of the league, now you salute him. Then he really <laughs> made me salute him. Wow. <laughs> so, what a moment. Yes, yes. 
you know, those are the traditions and, uh, you know, moments which, uh, you know, same, some connections that has been created. So he made me salute and then, uh, you know, while I took my car and they were all, uh, you know, lined up on the both the sides when I'm moving out of uh, the base. So the complete personnel of the base were lined up on the left and right side and, you know, they were all saluting me when I was moving out. Very, very emotional moment, right? Very emotional moment that I just told my wife that, you know, I don't know how I've done it. So that was it. Then it took me a couple of days to come over it. Yeah. That's the time I got in touch with you. <laughs> right, right. So it's a good segue for us to move on to the next question. Um, we would like to now understand the reason for leaving uh, the Indian Navy. You mentioned that a couple of times in the last question yes. that, you know, you would tell us. So please share that with us. The thing is, it's been 25 years, 20, 23, 25 years that I've served the Indian Navy. And uh, what was happening is, uh, you know, there are some rules as per the rules I'm supposed to go out of uh, the station and I have to serve to another place. So I have to go on a transfer, basically. Right. And the transfer was coming a uh, little away. It was like a non-family station transfer. Uh -huh. So, I was not, uh, it's not that I was not in favor. I have done long family stations. So, on the other hand, I must tell you that, you know, my daughter has been playing squash. And she for a national level squash player. And she has also represented, uh, you know, India for Asian juniors. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. a proud moment. Yeah. Yes, it's a very proud moment. And I have been, you know, it's and it is not possible for a child to reach this place other than her skill. Parents' involvement is quite a bit. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. So I, I was uh, totally dedicated uh, to her uh, development in the last four years. And I have come to this level that she has gone there. And I'm very hopeful that... I will call you up by end this year or next year. I will tell that she's playing Dutch Open or a you know, UK Open, British Open. So that is one of the, my core reason, you know, for my daughter, I had to quit me. So it was something like, you know, whether I go ahead and I cannot pursue her dreams, her aspirations, then I have to let go. Because there's another daughter, she, well, like my wife has to take care of her. Okay, so, Somebody has to take her for you know, tournament. Somebody has to take her for training. So, he uh, kind of a conscious call I had to take. These are tough calls. Sometimes, you know, we all have to take those calls, you know, when it comes to family or it comes to profession. Uh, there's no right or wrong here. No, in fact, my daughter only, we did a family talk, you know, all four of us. We are into this, that every day, five minutes, we do a family talk. So I told, uh, my daughter's name is Nibrit. So I told Nibrit, we to kind of quit, call a quit for the Navy and I have to be dedicated to you. So she was very upset. She didn't know about You cannot call a quit just because of me. I told her it's not because of you. It is because of myself. Because I want my daughter to, you are not telling me. I want my daughter, I want to support my daughter. I want to be with my daughter. I do not want to be away two years when my daughter and my family needs me the most at this moment. There were times, two, two years, three, three years, I've been away from my family. Not a problem. He was gone. My mother was able to manage everything. Parents were able to, my parents, my wife's parents were able to come and help us. But now they're different. Parents have requirements that come. They are demanding because, you know, they are getting unwell. So your studies are catching up. Your squash is catching up. So there's a conscious call as a father act today. Sure. And now she's back into training. Hopefully, she should win British Open one day. Sure. Wish her all the luck from our side. Thank you, Kamana Mandeep, for spending time with us. We spoke about a variety of topics ranging from rescue operations in Malaysia, how the role of technology has evolved in the last many years, and leadership lessons from the Indian Navy. It was indeed a very interesting conversation, and we appreciate your time. Have a good day. Thank you so much for calling me over. Pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much.
Well, in today's bonus pick, we are recommending arts and culture from Google. Ever wanted to visit the Taj Mahal or the White House from your living room? Yeah, it's possible now. Just visit Art and Culture from Google, where 2,000 plus leading museums and archives have curated and partnered with the Google Cultural Institute to bring the history to showcase and share their cultural treasures with a global audience online. Check it out by visiting artsandculture.google.com. <laughs>